Hi, welcome to Mechanical PE Exam Prep Question of the Week, the series where I solve mechanical engineering problems for aspiring professional engineers. In this video, I'll explain the partial pressure of water vapor and air, what that is, why you should care, and how it ties in with humidity. Now, if you're a PE candidate and a mechanical engineer taking the machine design or thermal fluids exam, you want to have a basic awareness of psychrometrics, but if you're an HVAC and refrigeration candidate, you really want to become an expert on psychrometrics. You want to read MERM chapter 38, and every paragraph, every equation should all make sense to you. If anything there is confusing or challenging, you want to take the time to struggle through it because those strengths are going to be the foundation on which the rest of your HVAC and refrigeration understanding is going to grow. So take the time to think about some of the concepts I'm bringing up here. And don't just rush through and record the key formulas and say, oh, okay, I'll plug that in when I need it. Really take the time and think through some of these things and ask a question if you're not sure. Or go over it with a colleague or a fellow PE candidate, and you'll both be better for it. So I'm going to use an example to illustrate what the partial pressure of water vapor and air is by thinking about the relative humidity. So right now in my room, it's 74 degrees Fahrenheit and 32% relative humidity. So we can plot that point on the psych chart. And if we want to find out what the partial pressure of water vapor and air is right now, there are a number of ways that we can do that. Probably the easiest way is to imagine that the air in the room is being cooled sensibly. So no change to the amount of water vapor in the air, just changing the dry bulb temperature all the way until it reaches the saturation curve. We call that the dew point. So the dew point temperature is 42.3 degrees. And when you get to the dew point, the air is said to be saturated. In other words, it has a 100% relative humidity. It cannot hold any more water vapor. So when you're at the saturation pressure, the partial pressure of water vapor is as high as it can ever be. And that's the first formula that we can use. It's not even really a formula, it's just a lookup. The partial pressure of water vapor is the saturation pressure at the dew point. So for a given state point that you're starting from, some temperature and relative humidity, just like what's in my room right now, you find the corresponding dew point temperature, 42.3, and then you go into the steam tables and find out what the saturation pressure of water vapor is for that temperature. So I did that, and I used, uh, I actually didn't use 42.3 because I didn't feel like interpolating, but the saturation pressure for 42 degrees so I'll just write here at T equals 42 degrees Fahrenheit. That saturation pressure is 0.1316 PSIA. So the atmospheric pressure is 14.7, and the partial pressure of water vapor is only 0.1316. So the total contribution to the pressure in the air that comes from water vapor is pretty small. Now it is rather dry, but even when air becomes nearly saturated, the contribution to the total pressure in the air that comes from water vapor remains pretty small for almost the entire psychrometric chart. It stays down around 5% or less. And then as air gets hotter and hotter, it has greater and greater capacity to take on water vapor, and eventually that can become a more meaningful percentage, but it doesn't happen at normal temperatures that we would feel relatively comfortable in. So how does that tie in with humidity, because we talk about relative humidity all the time. Well, the definition of relative humidity, and I'll use the Greek symbol phi, is the partial pressure of water vapor as a fraction of the maximum partial pressure that water vapor could have at a given temperature. So let's call that the saturation pressure for a given dry bulb temperature, in this case, 74 degrees. So this is a little different approach. This is like saying, we're going to go up vertically from our state point until we hit the saturation curve and ask the question, what is the saturation pressure at that point? That's a number we can look up in the steam table as well. And I've done that, and that number turns out to be 0.416. That's the maximum that the partial pressure of water vapor could be at 74 degrees. If it was 74 degrees and 100% relative humidity, then the partial pressure of water vapor would be that but it's not 100% relative humidity, it's only 32%. And that's where this definition comes in. So if I rearrange this formula to solve for partial pressure of water vapor, 
then it's the relative humidity times the saturation pressure at that dry bulb temperature. So in this case, only 32% of 0.416, which works out to 0.1331, which is pretty close to what we got when we did it the other way. And this was a bit of rounding, so this is probably the more accurate result. So already, we have two different methods to calculate the vapor pressure of water and air using the psych chart and the steam table. But I really want to help you get as flexible as possible in thinking about this concept of vapor pressure. So let's come at this another way. Let's think about a box of air. If I took some of the air that's in my room and put it in a box, and let's say I conveniently selected the size of that box to match up with the specific volume. So the specific volume of air in my room is 13.58 cubic feet per pound of dry air. Well, what if we only think about the dry air? Well, if we go vertically straight down and say, what would be the specific volume of dry air that was 74 degrees, 0% relative humidity? That would be about 13.45. So out of that 13.58, 13.45 of the cubic feet is dry air. So it's some mixture of nitrogen, maybe four parts nitrogen for every one part oxygen, approximately. And that's all just dry air, specifically one pound of dry air. And in the remaining volume, you have 0.13 cubic feet of water vapor, H2O. Now, why is this useful to think about it in terms of volume? Well, anytime you have a mixture of gases, you can find the fraction of the total mixture by volume or the fraction of the total mixture by moles, let's call that the mole fraction, those are equal for a given molecule in the mixture. And the volume fraction and the mole fraction correspond to the partial pressure. So if you have a box that's made up of one-tenth water vapor, then one-tenth of the total pressure of that box comes from the contribution of water vapor. So let's see what the contribution of water vapor is in this mixture. Well, it's 0.13 of the total cubic feet is the volume of the water vapor in that mixture. And what's the total volume of the mixture? 13.58. What is that as a percentage? That turns out to be about 0.96%. So just under 1% of the mixture by volume and by moles is water vapor, which means that water vapor is responsible for 1% of the total pressure. So let's take that 0.96, multiply it by the total pressure. It's atmospheric pressure, right? Because I'm just in an ordinary room. So we'll just multiply that by 14.7 PSIA, and that turns out to be 0.14 PSIA, which is pretty close to what we got in the other two choices, just a bit higher, but close to that 0.1331 and the 0.1316. Now we're 0.14. So right there, that is the partial pressure of water vapor. That, that's what it means. So if you really think about that box of air, if you add more water vapor to the air, then it becomes a larger and larger volume fraction of the air, which means it contributes more and more to the total pressure. That doesn't mean the total pressure in the room goes higher. The total pressure in the room is still gonna be 14.7, but the contribution to that pressure that comes from water vapor is greater and greater up until it reaches the saturation point, at which point the air cannot hold any wa more water vapor. So the presence of any more water vapor will just lead to it condensing out of the air. When we get to that point, that means we're on the saturation curve. By whatever means we got there, we could have got there by adding water vapor to the air, that's latent heating, or we could have got there by sensibly cooling the air until we got to the saturation curve, or some combination of the two, like what happens in cooling towers. The point being that saturation curve represents when the air cannot hold any more water. We say it's 100% relative humidity. And coming back to formula two, the partial pressure of water vapor is 100% of what it could be for that temperature. So hopefully that's starting to really tie this together. Now there's a couple more methods that are a little less about intuition and a bit more off the beaten trail, but I wanna at least mention them so that you have the fullest possible picture. So that was two methods and then this volume method was the third way of thinking about it. The fourth way is an empirical formula. It's called the carrier equation. I haven't done my research, but I presume that uh, 
the same person that created the air conditioning empire carrier was involved in this, perhaps credited for it. And this says, the partial pressure of water vapor in air is equal to the saturation pressure at the wet bulb temperature. We haven't dealt with this before, right? We dealt with dew point and dry bulb so far. Now we're talking wet bulb. Minus the difference between the total pressure and the saturation pressure of wet bulb again, that quantity, times the difference between the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperature, TdB minus TwB, over 2830 minus 1.44 times the wet bulb temperature. So don't ask me how this was derived or how the units work out. Empirical formulas are a bit of black magic. Not really, I mean, somebody did an experiment and determined that this curve roughly fits the situation. I'm just not aware of all the details, but that's fine, we'll trust it. And we have our other answers to check against. So we need to know the wet bulb temperature. We haven't looked that up yet. I can pop back up to the psych chart. And I'm also using a psychrometric calculator to check myself as I go. You're welcome to do the same when you're practicing. Just don't become overly reliant on it because you won't have it during the exam. So that's 56.4 and I need to know the saturation pressure at the wet bulb temperature, so I'll go to the steam table for that. At 56 degrees, it's 0.2221. At 58 degrees, it's 0.2387, but I wanna know what it is at 56.4, so I have to interpolate. I can do 2387 minus 2221. That difference is 166 but I'm spanning two degrees, so that's 83 per degree, and I'm really only interested in the change over four tenths of a degree, so multiply 83 by four tenths, that's 33.2, so it's gonna be 2221 plus 33, which is 2254. This is not a video on interpolating. If you have any questions about that, we can talk more about interpolating, but uh, I do recommend you spend some time figuring out how to Think about interpolating, how to do it quickly, how to do it comfortably, how to sense check your answer. I can tell, and you can surely tell as well, that this is a reasonable choice uh, in this range between these two numbers. It's closer to the smaller number, which it should be. Anyway, that is the saturation pressure at the wet bulb temperature. The total pressure is atmospheric pressure, so 14.7. Let's go ahead and start plugging some of these numbers in. 0.2254, and I'm gonna skip units because it's an empirical formula. 14.7 minus 0.2224 again, times that delta T, the dry bulb is 74, the wet bulb is 56.4. 2830 minus 1.44 times 56.4. That all turns out to be 0.1629, which is a bit higher than what we got on the other methods and I'm attributing that to it being an empirical formula and it potentially being a bit off. But to be honest, I don't have a ton of experience with this formula, it's kind of a backup, so I'm pretty content to say that that's close enough. And yet another way, a fifth method, is to use the humidity ratio. Now I really wanna do a whole separate video on humidity ratio and the formulas that are related to it, but for now, I'm just gonna show you this formula. And I don't think this is an empirical formula. I think it's theoretical. So the unit should work out, but I don't know exactly how that all works. So I'm gonna gloss over a little bit of detail, just being conscious of time. So we know all of these things for our situation. We know the total pressure is 14.7. We just need the humidity ratio. So that's a nice formula to have. If you wanna know the partial pressure of water vapor, or if you wanna know the relative humidity, you might need to know this along the way. The total pressure is typically atmospheric pressure for most normal air conditioning applications. If you know the humidity ratio, you can find this, so that's great. We have our state point here. Let's jump across and pick up the humidity ratio. I'm gonna give you impossibly high precision here, 0 0.00571 pounds of water vapor per pound of dry air at that point, so 14.7 times 0 0.00571 over 0.622 plus 0 0.00571. And that works out to 0 0.134 PSIA. Very close to the answers that we got in the earlier method. So that is reassuring to see. And I will do a video later on humidity ratio and some of these derivations. But I just wanted to show you that's yet another way. And then the sixth method is not so much a method as 
wouldn't it be nice if the psych chart had a scale on it where you could just read the vapor pressure from the scale? Well, this one doesn't, but some psych charts do. So if you wanna look into that, you can find yourself a psych chart that has a vapor scale, and that will save you some time. So the key ideas here, the relative humidity is defined as the vapor pressure of water and air as a percentage of what it could be at that temperature. So always remember this vertical line. How far you are up this vertical line determines your relative humidity. If you're 32% of the way up this line, it's a 32% relative humidity. And these curves are just milestones along the way, but it's really, you know, you can think of it almost graphically. You can think about the length of this section of the line as a fraction of the entire length of that line, which by the way, is a different line as you move to the right, as you increase in dry bulb temperature, boy, does that line get tall, right? As you cool down, that line gets very short. And that's why you can have an increase in relative humidity without actually changing the water content in the air. Just by decreasing the temperature, you're effectively increasing the relative humidity. Just why relative humidity is not always the best metric, right? It's relative. The humidity ratio is sometimes a better metric to use because as you move right to left, the humidity ratio doesn't change. It's the same amount of mass of water vapor per unit mass of dry air, and you can deal with the dry bulb temperature on one axis and the humidity ratio on the other. And the other big point, which we kind of alluded to earlier, is that water vapor contributes relatively little to the total pressure of air, even moist air. So maybe up to about 5%, let's say. Um, you know, in this case, it was around 1%, but it's fairly dry. So you could imagine a case where the moisture content is considerably higher and that percent would increase, but not by a whole heck of a lot, maybe up to about 5%. And then when the temperatures get very high, higher than what's offered up on the psychrometric chart, then maybe it could be higher still. But you should expect the partial pressure of water vapor and air to be well under 10% of the total pressure for most HVAC applications. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this video. If you're a mechanical engineer studying for the PE exam and you would like to get your question on one of the question of the week videos, the best way to do that is to send me an email, dan at mechanicalpeexamprep.com. I try to make these videos fun. I enjoy making them. I hope you enjoy watching them and hope you get a lot out of them. And if you wanna make your study process as efficient as possible, Sign up for my courses if you haven't already. First you get the fundamentals, then you do lots of practice problems. It's a great way to give direction and clarity to your preparation and take your studying to the next level. It's what I wish I had when I was studying. The best way to get the courses is directly through my website. You get a better price there than on Udemy. And if you use the link below and the coupon code MEC10, you can get an additional 10% off. Until next week, happy studying.